Uh, this season of the This Is Podcast and Live the Bible has been absolutely amazing, and I'm so glad that it's been a blessing to many of you. Thanks you for listening. Thanks for watching today. Uh, we're doing something a little bit different for our last episode this season of Live the Bible. You know, a lot of people do their top five or their top ten. Of course, I'm going to be weird. I'm going to have my top six moments from the Live the Bible uh, interviews that we did. Um, these are all moments that I think stood out uh, in these different conversations. And that if you didn't get to watch all of those um, or you didn't get to watch all of them in their entirety, I just went ahead and put together some very important key moments in those conversations uh, that I thought were important and I think they'll be an encouragement to you. So here's my Live the Bible the top six. Live the Bible, a Biblicist podcast. But if I had to choose between revival or the country that I want, what would I choose? Mm. And I'm afraid that a lot of Christians in America, because they're so used to comfort and the things that we want, we would choose that over that. Now, I'm not saying that we have to. Sure. I'm not saying that we have to choose revival um, and we can't have the country that we're, we desire to have. Yeah. Um, I think we can seek after God and stand for truth and stand for religious freedom and stand for our rights as Americans. Sure. And, and absolutely, I think we can do both of those things. Mm -hmm. But I'm just using that as an extreme example. Sure. I'm afraid that sometimes we can get so caught up in politics that we forget who we are in Christ and what our calling is um, in Christ, yeah. first and foremost. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that that's a good, it's a good question. It's a good question to ask ourselves. Would we be willing... Um, to to withgo some of the even freedoms, the comforts that we've had, um, and would we would we name the name of Christ, even if it costs something? Yeah. Um, and again, like not that we want that or desire that, um, but it's a good point. Like, cause, I mean, I think we can have a a spiritual revival, um, regardless. Yeah. Of who's in office. Yes. Regardless of even what the political policies are, and we just have to look. We just have to look to history to see that. Absolutely. Where the church can and has thrived even in a context of suffering yeah. and persecution. This, I think one another reason why we've kind of gotten away from the truth is because in Christian circles, we've heard a preference or a standard preached as a universal truth. Mm. But then we go to college or then we go visit a friend in another state. And all of a sudden, another preacher of God's word is preaching just as hard against another random issue that's not in God's word. And we're using these applications as this is what God's saying, and he really isn't. And so we've watered down what truth is. Now, these Christian high schoolers are saying, I don't know what to believe. You know, my pastor was preaching against this, this song or this trend. Or he was preaching against Facebook and the next year he has it. Like, what, what can I, I can't trust that. You know, what else is he saying that's not right or that's not accurate biblically? So I think that's another thing we have to be careful about is we need to make sure that when we say this is true or this is God's word, that it is. Because if not, then it's going to cause some people to doubt what truth is. And, you know, if... If truth is our preference, then it's not going to be able to guide us. That's literally the issue with feelings is that it changes and that it's subjective. So we really just have to get back to a universal truth. This is God's word. It's what yeah. he said. It's an eternal truth that does not change. So you can hold on to it. So in regards to that, like of, of talking about um, pastors or Bible teachers um, declaring preferences or, or concepts which aren't necessarily biblical um, and and there being a confusion or a watering down of what the truth is like I think for people like you and I like that that should challenge us with that accountability to not cause that like yeah. wanting to be so dedicated to the truth um because that that it breeds confusion and and in fact it's a um um unfortunately i recently was reading um a a post and reading some comments from a lot of people that are bitter because of that 
um, because they're they're confused about truth um, because a bunch of things are preached as if they were Bible solid universal truth and they weren't they were just opinions and um, and so I think it's very important that we let people know the difference in our conversations between our opinion versus here's a scriptural truth Be- oh, yeah. you know and so like if <clears throat> Like uh, someone texted me today asking me some Bible questions and the question that they asked me, I don't personally think is explicitly clear in scripture. I think it's implied in scripture, but not necessarily explicitly clear. So in my response to the, my, in answering the question, I said, it seems to me that the Bible teaches this. Like I was very careful how I word that answer. And, and, and I, and so I do have an opinion on this, you know, the subject and here's my answer to it, but I'm not going to say, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, scripture teaches this and you should believe this. Um, especially if the scripture doesn't explicitly say something like I just, I can't, I won't cross that because there's so much that scripture is explicit about. There's so much that scripture is very clear on. And that's what I want to emphasize. Oh, absolutely. That's the key right there is that there's so much that is clear in God's word that we should be emphasizing that we're not. And we've we've shouted where the Bible's silent and we've whispered where the Bible shouts. And so this is an, a call and an implorement to the church at large, yeah. the body of Christ, that we've got to pursue authenticity authentic worship and authenticity instead of we don't want to let our pastor and church and community down. Well, I, 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 I actually, I understand what you're saying and I think it, it comes from a sincere place, but the question, (laughs) what we should be saying is I don't, The problem is people are going to choose not to let down people and choose to be fake before God instead. Yes. That's the problem. Yes. I'm going to maybe you'll think that I, and, and I've been there, man, like so many times where I'd have conversations with people and the fakest conversations Yeah. where I would pretend like something bothered me or upset me when it didn't. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like so I, I understand the world very fully in regards to that. Um and so it's and so I'd say one of two reasons, the reasons why you you know your church didn't talk about it is either because your leadership wasn't authentic or you had a church culture that valued perception over reality. Yeah. You see, because for me, for me growing up, and, and, and I grew up homeschooled as well. So for me, church was all society for me. That's, that's my social structure. Right. So I didn't have a school. I didn't have, you know, I, all my, even sporting events was connected to the church. So that's my whole social circle. And that's all that mattered to me was that social circle. So on Sunday, as long as I wore a suit and tie, had a nice iron shirt and a King James Bible under my arm and smiled and had my hair nice and kept clean shaven and said the right words, then wow, Caleb, he's a leader. He's a spiritual leader in the church. Look at him. He sings at the right times. He goes to the altar at the right times. Because I did, quote unquote, all the right things. And I couldn't have been more fake than a Ken Barbie doll. (laughs) Um, And so, but the thing is, I didn't even recognize it then because I knew initially that I was fake. I knew when I was putting on the makeup, right? Right. 
I knew while I was doing it what I was doing. I knew that on Sunday morning when I hurried up and opened my Bible and read a few verses, just in case someone asked me what I read in my Bible that week, Yeah. I knew what I was doing. You're right. I was playing the game. Yeah. But eventually I believed it. Yes. Eventually. Eventually I conned myself and found the game of perception to be more valuable than being authentic. And because of that, it's an ongoing struggle and ongoing pursuit of emptying myself and, and the awkwardness of authenticity and, um, or being willing to have awkward conversations or, or to put yourself out there. And so it's a constant struggle because I played the game for so long. And, and so anyway, I hope that kind of answers the question or dives more into like personal, personal aspects of that. And here's the thing, man, you have two choices and these are very real choices. If you find yourself in that scenario and you are concerned with perception or letting people down, you name it, you can either cho- choose to expose yourself now before other people, or you can choose to be exposed by God when you see him on that day. Whew. Yeah. It is your choice. You can either expose yourself before other people and say, look, this is not real. Things are not right and endure the potential, quote, backlash from people. Or you will stand before God, having lived a life of inauthenticity, and have to look, I just can't, I can't even picture it, man, just having to look on Jesus and know that it was all fake. Yeah. Yeah. It's not worth it. No, it is not worth it. Not only for that moment, but for all you miss out on, like we've already talked about. It's not worth it for now. (laughs) No. It's 2020. It's been a very divisive year. Oh. Um, The most divisive year of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I've heard many people say, you know, older than me, of their lifetime and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. If, yeah, we were to I, break, if I were to break it down and actually try and really study that out, I don't know. Yeah, so it's it's the worst in my lifetime, and that's yeah. three times yours. Yeah. <laughs> so so that being said, is we we want to do a lot of finger pointing right now, and I understand that we want to point at the leaders of the nation. We talked about that accountability. We want to point, we want to point at a party. Mm-hmm. We want to point at. Um, the people on the streets. We want to point at different organizations. We want to point at whatever, right? And I'm not even going to take the time to break all that down. But we want to, and once again, I think we should call out things that are wrong. We stand for morality. But if this principle is true, then the answer is for God's people to repent of their sins. Mm -hmm. Then that means... Blaming and pointing at everybody else isn't what God is calling the church to do. It's actually calling them to repent and acknowledge that they're also sinners. Yeah, they've also, you know, and so that, that's that's. I'm glad you brought that up because I think that is timely for us uh, in regards to an election season and with the division of 2020. Like, mm-hmm. um, and it, I know it's complicated. It's hard even for believers to try and maneuver this because it seems like you can't even like talk about something even in a nice generous way without you know ah you don't can't take that position or this position or say anything right right. well that's okay um maybe we just need to learn to get back on our knees maybe we need to learn how to Mm. rest in christ again and 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 strive for him and um and seek for righteousness in him and versus waiting for other people to yeah. do it. I think it's it's human nature to want to place the blame. Yeah. When things aren't going right, well, it must be mm-hmm. you know, players are not playing. Well, for a long time, baseball wasn't happening. Yeah. 
and I was it, it a big debate was it the owners was it the players right. and we you know, blame and they kept blaming each other yeah. and uh, that's the nature human nature yeah just to let you know where my head is it's more on baseball than, <laughs> than where we been. but I, I think you're right I, I I do that yeah something's not working something's not happening right at home well it must be my wife's fault yeah and then I realized that my wife doesn't have faults and you know like, <laughs> what am I gonna do now uh, but I just I, you're right, I, and I want, and I do. I want to find, I want to find who's at fault, and I think that's really, really wrong. Yeah. What we need to do, we need to just don't focus on what's going on, yeah. other than our relationship with God. Yeah. Humble ourselves before God, turn from our wicked ways, seek His face. Mm-hmm. You know, you can put those things together, and, and if the church itself, per person were to absolutely commit to that mm-hmm. i think we would see huge yeah. wholesale changes yeah. going on in our country no no that's good like that's the theme in jeremiah malachi what do we do yeah. what do we do wrong <laughs> yeah, we right. do nothing what does it mean how, how do you define worship uh the three songs before the message <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, no, that's really funny because I think that is, that's probably a very common thing for people to think of what is worship, and, Agreed. um, and it's funny because like it's a pet peeve of mine, uh, and it's been this way for a while, is, and once again, I don't, I'm not gonna be like really weird about this because I wouldn't hold this against anybody, but like personally, I don't like the terminology worship leader. Or like yeah. worship pastor because it feels like it's constructing it to be that Sunday morning moment. Yeah. Um, and um, and I've made the joke to people. It's like I because I, I mean I lead singing at 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 the church that I'm a part of now, and it's like I I'm not your worship leader because I'm not following you around on Monday leading you in worship. Yes. Um, and so that's I'm imp- I'm implying that worship is something. Uh, much greater than Sunday morning's song service, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead and, and give definition there. Well, that was my answer. I don't know what I'm going to do now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah. Uh, music can be part of it for sure, but it's not it. Um, for me, how I would describe worship in my own words is a valuing or treasuring of something or someone Hmm. there's a um i'll give an example in a second but when you value or you treasure something it's going to lead to you giving of yourself to whatever that is yeah you prioritize and organize your life around it you have deemed that thing the most important thing uh, a good way to summarize this is probably uh, worship is the outflow of something that has captured your heart. Hmm. And I'll give it an example. For some people, they worship money. Right. That has captured their heart. And so what they do is they do everything they can to get it. They will organize their life in a way that they can pick up extra shifts at work because they're going to make more money. They will hoard it. They will make making money a priority even over time with family or doing other things. Money is the most important thing to them, and they give their whole selves to it. Um, I probably get in trouble for this one. That some people worship sports. Yep. You know, they're going to yell and cheer from the sidelines or the stands. They'll talk about their team wherever they go. They'll clear the schedules to make sure they can make every single home game. Uh, if they can't make it to an away game, they'll sit and watch on the couch to make sure nothing interrupts them. They'll name you every single player on the team because sports – has captured their heart, yeah, and you see the outflow in their actions. So once something has captured your heart, 
once you've seen its value, its worth, once you've decided that's the most important thing, what follows is worship. Yeah. You give of yourself, your time, your abilities, your careers, your mm-hmm. family. You give everything. Does to- my why of worshiping God matter as much as what he commands me to do and vice versa? I Yeah. It, I would argue, and this may be considered heresy by some, <laughs> but <laughs> I would argue that the why is more important than the what. Wow. And don't get me wrong. The what is definitely important. Yeah. But I even read just yesterday, man, this is crazy that we're talking about this. I started reading in Isaiah. Uh, don't ask me why. I started reading in Isaiah yesterday, the very first chapter. God speaks to the children of Israel mm-hmm. and calls out how they have been wicked and they have been far from him and even goes as far to say that he is tired of their sacrifices and their offerings, yeah. that he does not delight in the blood of bulls and goes on and on and on. That was their way of worshiping, man. Like God commanded them to do all of these things, uh, to offer a sin offering and this offering and this offering. And God just came out and he said, I'm tired of these. Yeah. And I think it's in Hosea where he says something similar again. Yeah. And he says, I desire for you to love me. Yeah. It's not about what you're doing. <laughs> it's the why. Yes. You, your heart is so far from me. Yes. And yet here you are going through the motions. That's not what I want. Yeah. I want you to love me. I don't want you to do this because you have to. Yeah. The why is so much more important, I think. I would say I, I think I agree with you. I and And once again, to our listeners, this isn't – this isn't because it's a hip, cool thing. This isn't like, oh, let's talk about this or or authenticity being some like hip conversation or something. Is that this is a theme in scripture where where God is clearly, obviously not using these words, but God is clearly calling for authenticity w- with Israel. Um, yeah. Where you have these cases of like, you're doing all the things that I've, you know, these acts of worship that I've called you to do. But it's not from a place of authenticity. It's all a facade. It's yeah. it's just it's just there. It exists. And and once again, back to me personally, I'm afraid for once again a majority of my life that I have focused on making sure I got the what right and never even stopped to think about why. Yeah. Why worship God? Right. Why seek his face? Why sing his praises? Why read his word? Why go to him in prayer? Yeah. Just go down the list of, of the things that you do that as, as you're trying to, to follow after God and worship him. Why? Yeah. And, I, and so I, I'm afraid that like the mo- majority of my life, and I, it's weird because I think when I was a kid, even before I was a genuine believer as a kid, I think I understood the why initially better. Because when I was a child, I just had this kind of natural awe of God. Yeah. And and I loved to sing songs to God. And I love like God's just awesome. He's the He created me. He's the creator of the universe. And he's good and he's and he's holy. And 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 like it's funny because even Old Testament stories that scare some people. As a kid, I would read these Old Testament stories and be like, well, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. Like I was that kind of in awe of God. Like yeah. he's just, he's God, he's sovereign, he's God, he can do whatever he wants and I love him and he's amazing. But then as I grew up <laughs> and and kind of, if you will, lost my childlike faith, all of a sudden my mind was more of thinking that the what was more important than the why. Anyway, I, I, I can be, I just, I desperately want my Christian friends and 
to be in awe of God in a way like they've never been before. So yeah. it's so in love with him and enthralled with the love that he has for them that they can't help but worship him. They can't help but submit to him. And 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 this is why like that's why to worship God is not a burden. Yeah, exactly. It's light. <laughs> yeah. It's life. <laughs> it's light and it's like it's um and so I just so yeah, I agree with you 100%. The why is so much more important than the what. Because when when the what becomes more important, or maybe even when it becomes equal, that's when you will start running into legalism. Yes. You will start running into a world of, um, I'm worshiping God better than you are. Yeah, like, like, exactly. But that's not worship. What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, the, the what leads to self righteousness. Yeah. The why leads to being filled with the Spirit. 